Welcome back, Law and Crime Network, Dan Abrams Production. We have a real special and interesting, uh, yet again sad, uh, case, uh, if you guys may remember, uh, James Home Theater shooting. We're going back to July of 2012, July 20 to be exact in Aurora, Colorado. You may remember the man goes into the movie theater. There's a picture of him right there, crazy red hair. Uh, he goes in with dark armor, gas mask, tactical shotgun, high capacity assault rifle, a gun, and tear gas. He was there to do business. And in fact, he accomplished that result, killing 12 people, wounding, eight, uh, wounding 58 other people, including children and a pregnant woman. And he was just found calmly waiting in his car, very atypical for people that do this, just waiting for the police to come and pick him up. Well, listen, not only is it a fascinating case in a macabre, disgusting, sickening way, but what can we really learn from this case? Many times we don't know. We can't get inside the mind of a monster like this. But we do have somebody with us that could come the closest to having done that. And that is Dr. William Reed. He is a forensic psychiatrist, and he has written a book called A Dark Night in Aurora. Now, you may ask yourself a question, well, is this just one of these guys opining about, you know, the uh, second seat armchair quarterbacking? No. Dr. Reed, who you see on your screen right there, he is a person who was actually hired to evaluate this individual. And as I understand it, doctor, and welcome to the show, you were able to look at diaries, defendant, uh, multiple defendant interviews over 23 hours. You were able to look at phone calls and texts of this guy that we see on the screen, talk to family members and acquaintances. You were able to get the court file. Look at this crazy look on this guy's face. He just, his eyes just look insane to me, doc. Uh, you were able to look at the prosecutor's evidence. You were able to speak to the victims. And you have written this book, A Dark Night in Aurora. Man, there is nobody better than you, Doc, to talk about what goes inside the mind of a madman. What'd you find out? Well, Bob, thanks for having me on. And I'm sorry that we're uh, that there's a tragedy has caused having me on. Uh, but you've described it uh, pretty accurately. Um, I'm glad to be here and happy to answer any questions that you may have. Well, let's start with this, Doc. I mean, can you give me, in, in a sentence or two, what compels what was an otherwise normal individual? I looked on the site where your book is being sold, and we're going to get to that in a minute, and it was, I, I took a quote out of there that I felt was pretty fascinating. A chilling and gripping study of abnormal psychology and how a lovely boy named Jimmy became a killer. Can you give us in a sentence or two, how does a lovely boy named Jimmy become a killer? I wish I could because it would make great media. Mm -hmm. um, he was a lovely boy named Jimmy. His upbringing was uh, pretty much normal. There was no indication before he was a teenager that there was anything seriously wrong. Uh, the way he became a killer uh, is very complex, and I'm not sure anyone will ever understand it. It involves his mental illness. Uh, it involves some very strange ideas that he had. Um, and. He was literally a one in a million or more people who was on that path and eventually committed such a, a tragic and horrendous act. You know, Doctor, uh, you have had a, a, a window into this person because he was voluntarily cooperating with you, giving you interviews. And I guess the question many of us would have on our minds is, were there signs beforehand that this kind of carnage was going to occur? There really weren't. Uh, he wasn't telling people. He was planning it for weeks and months before, but he talked with psychiatrists, he talked with friends. Uh, there were some things that you can see in retrospect that were concerning, but no one really could reasonably have known this was going to happen except Holmes himself. Now, he obviously had a cachet of some serious uh, firepower with him, and there's always a debate in this country about the uh, gun rights and whatever, and I don't want to get too much into the politics of that, but let me ask you, had he not had access, first of all, how did he get access to all these things, and had he not had access to it, Doc, do you think it would have not occurred, or was he just a machine on a course of action, and he was going to do it one way or the other? He had the same kind of access that almost everyone in the country has and several other countries. Uh, he got the weapons legally. He bought them over time, uh, ammunition, other things, material for explosives. Uh, but he had the same access and bought them the same places that hundreds of thousands of people or millions 
do every day. Had he not had that access, now I'm no gun control expert, and, and it's not my, not my shtick, uh, but I'm quite convinced that had he not had, had access to firearms, he would have chosen another, another way because his mission, and he called it a mission, was to kill as many people as he could, and he considered non-firearm ways. It's just that he chose the firearm way for a variety of practical reasons. Well, when he told you this, Doc, that he was committed to doing this and killing people, did he give a reason why? Was there a motive? Was it revenge? Was it notoriety? Was it just banal, just pure mental illness? His version, and it's really the only version we have, is his version, and I talked with him two years later, not really at the time, uh, was a multiple one. And the reasons don't sound very logical to you and I and, and, and your viewers. One was that he had the idea, whether it's a delusion or whether it's just a, 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 an overvalued idea, as we shrink sometimes call it, that everyone has a point, has one point of human capital. And if he were to kill another person, he would acquire their human capital point. So if he killed 12 people, he now has 13 human capital points. That didn't give him any special power, didn't give him any special longevity. It was, it was almost a way of keeping score. He feels better having 13 than he felt having 12. That was one thing that he described as a reason. A second thing was a sort of a selfish thing, and I say that because I think that, and he himself came to that belief with me, and that is that he felt a bit depressed from time to time and thought there was about a 50-50 chance that if he killed a lot of people, he would feel better. So he would trade their lives and the collateral damage, that's his word, uh, the collateral damage uh, for a chance of feeling better. A small portion, he said, was related to his uh, averseness, uh, his hatred of humanity. But I hasten to say that his version of that hatred does not sound like a vengeful hatred. It sounds like, as I say in the book, and he said himself, Sounds like somebody who hates broccoli and stays away from it. Yeah, so, Doc, when you're interviewing him, um, you know, I note that he actually waited for the police to capture him, um, and, and that is a little unusual. Was this something that he was proud of when he spoke to you? And when you were speaking to him, even though the theories twisted in his head, was he speaking coherently? Very good questions. I don't think it was a question of pride. It was much more a matter of fact. He thought perhaps he would be killed in the process and he prepared to, to keep himself from being killed. Uh, he didn't have much thought of escape, uh, <coughs> but I don't think it's a, it's a matter of pride. Yes, when I talked with him, he made a lot of sense. He was not, as we would say, psychotic or, or out of touch with reality, uh, really at any time that I know of, except for uh, a few weeks after these events, uh, when he had a psychotic break in jail, so that I was able to talk with him just fine, as were other people. I'm not the only person who, who saw him. Uh, and although he spoke a little haltingly and a little oddly, uh, the information that he gave, the sentences, the words, uh, made, made sense syntactically, that is grammatically, uh, even though uh, some of the reasons and some of his ideas uh, were quite illogical in the long run. All right, Doc, I got two, two more questions for you, um, but the first being, when you're actually speaking to him and he's going through these 23 hours of interviews, did do you ever find that he had any level of remorse for what he had done? Not very much. He clearly said that he didn't want to kill children, and yet he did. Uh, I'm not sure he knew there was a child there, but he was... Uh, he was upset that he had killed a child, and I believe that. He said something like, I'm sorry other people had to be injured, uh, but that was collateral damage. So that's not, that's not very much remorse. Now, his mother believes, and I think it may be true, that he may have remorse that he cannot find inside him and cannot express, but that's pretty much speculation. And uh, anything in his background that would have led up psychologically or psychiatrically that was there as a marker beforehand that he was uh, at risk? Not for this kind of violence. Uh, his behavior and his statements to his girlfriend, for example, and to his psychiatrist that he thought about killing people 
are certainly markers, if you will, but they're not particularly psychiatric ones. Uh, you and I both know that the vast majority of people with mental illness, even serious mental illness, the great, great majority, are not violent. And the mentally ill uh, population is no more uh, at risk for violence than anybody else if we, use the, if, if we allow for the exception of substance abuse. I am far more worried about, about crackheads and, uh, and speeders and drunks than I am about people with, with Holmes' diagnosis. Well, doctor, listen, fascinating. I'm getting the book. I'm reading it. It's called A Dark Night in Aurora. Tell us real quick in 15 seconds, how can we get this book to our viewers? A Dark Night in Aurora is available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, anywhere you buy books, uh, online or in brick-and-mortar stores. I appreciate your, your mentioning the book. And I appreciate your offering an opportunity for clarification of this tragedy. That was my purpose, and I, I hope that readers uh, enjoy it. Doctor, thank you so much. Fascinating interview. Thank you for your excellent work. We showed the book right up there on the screen. We're going to go to a break, ladies and gentlemen. Come back on the other end. Thanks, Doc.